Hello students, Ms. Swanson here, and today we're going to take a look at compounds with polyatomic ions. We use these types of compounds on a regular basis, like baking soda, bleach, fertilizer, and even, this may not be a regular occurrence, but in fireworks they also have polyatomic ions. So we have three learning goals for today. To identify polyatomic compounds from their names and formulas, to determine the name of a polyatomic compound from its formula, and to determine the formula of a polyatomic compound from its name. So what is a polyatomic compound? Or what is a polyatomic ion that's involved in a polyatomic compound? Well, here we have lithium hydroxide. If you take a look at the symbol, or the symbols for that compound up at the top, you'll notice something very different than the other compounds we've been dealing with. It has lithium, oxygen, and hydrogen in it. So it has three different elements. So far, all of the compounds we've learned how to name have only two elements in them. So here we're learning how to name something that has actually more than two uh, different elements combined together. So what happens here is that a lithium become a lithium atom will turn into an ion and the hydroxide will become an ion and then they'll attract together based on the attraction of positive and negative charges. So lithium and oxygen and hydrogen. So here's the um, electron moving from lithium to the hydroxide. The lithium becomes positively charged, the hydroxide negatively charged, and then the two will attract together to form lithium hydroxide. So it's similar to your regular ionic compounds in that an electron is transferred and then the positive and negative attract. The only difference is that electron is transferred to a covalent compound. So something that's already bonded covalently, so sharing electrons, that overall covalent compound gains or loses an electron. So here's some examples of polyatomic compounds in white on the left and on the right, sorry, in, on the left there's the polyatomic compounds and on the right in orange it shows some polyatomic ions. These polyatomic ions come together with another element and it could be a standard ion or it could be another polyatomic ion but they'll come together to form a compound. So the first thing that you need to be able to do is to recognize which piece of the compound is the polyatomic piece. So if we look at these, uh, each of the different compounds, the first one, the PO4 is the polyatomic piece. If we look at our orange list there, this is called phosphate. In the second one, the SO4, it's called sulfate, and we can see that in the list. In the third one, inside the brackets, we have NO3, and that's called nitrate. In the fourth one, we have OH, and we saw this in the example. This is called hydroxide. And then in the fifth one, we have NH4, and this is called ammonium. So we have several different um, circumstances, but we do have some tips for finding which part is the, uh, is the uh, polyatomic piece. So usually it's the anion, so it comes at the end most of the time. And sometimes you'll see it inside of brackets. So anytime you see something inside of brackets, it's going to be polyatomic. And usually if you're looking at the compounds and you're trying to find the polyatomic piece, start by looking at the end and see if anything looks familiar to your polyatomic list in orange or the one that will be given to you for tests and quizzes. So here are the rules for naming polyatomic compounds. I'm not going to read through the list, but you can pause the video and write that down if you'd like to. I'm just going to go through the diagram. So you're going to start off by naming the cation, and if it happens to be a multivalent metal, you'll follow the normal rules for multivalent metals by including in brackets the charge on that metal. Then you're going to write the polyatomic anion. Now the polyatomic anions already have their own special endings, so we don't add IDE at the end. The only exception to these naming rules is if the polyatomic ion is the first piece and the second piece is a regular anion, then you would name it using the regular anion rules, adding IDE. So we saw that in the other uh, example, I think question number five was ammonium, uh, it might have been fluoride or something like that. So the fluoride, we would use fluor and then add the IDE. 
but normally if the polyatomic ion is the second piece, we just keep the ending as it is. So we'll take a look at a few examples here. So on the uh, left in white, I've got the list of polyatomic ions that you'll need to use. And we're going to use the metal and then the polyatomic anion um, as our rules. So we'll start off with CaCO3. Ca is the metal, so that's our calcium. And CO3 is carbonate, so that's our anion. And we know that the CO3 is the anion, is the polyatomic anion, because it's part of our list of polyatomic anions. So we have calcium carbonate, and that's how we would name it. Calcium because we know what CA stands for, and carbonate because we found it in our list of polyatomic anions. Then we have BA in brackets, ClO3, and then the other bracket, 2. Well, we know BA is barium, so that's our, our cation, that's a metal. And then ClO3 is chlorate, so that's a polyatomic anion. So we would name it barium and then chlorate, and we take the chlorate directly from the polyatomic list. Let's take a look at another one. Here we have iron, and we remember from before that iron could have a 2 plus charge or a 3 plus charge, so we're going to need to do a little bit of work here. And then we have PO4. So iron is the metal and PO4 is the polyatomic um, anion. So let's figure out which iron are we dealing with. We'll use our zero sum rule. So here we have one iron, which has a, uh, sorry, we have, not one, we have three irons which have an unknown charge X, and we'll add that to our two phosphates. And we know from up here, we can look at our phosphate, it has a three negative charge. So we'll write negative three, and overall it must have a charge of zero because that's the rule for ionic compounds, and that holds true for uh, polyatomic ionic compounds. So we end up with three X minus six equals zero, and if we bring our 6 to the other side, we have 3x equals 6. And we divide both sides by 3x equals 2. So we know that we're dealing with iron 2. So we would name this iron 2 phosphate. And the iron 2 comes from the zero sum rule that we use. The phosphate comes from the polyatomics list. Now let's look at how we would write formulas. You'll write the symbol for the metal. You'll write the number required of that metal as a subscript. You can use either the zero sum or the crossing over rule. You'll then write the polyatomic anion, and you'll write the number required either using the zero sum or the crossing over method. Now, if there's more than one of the polyatomic anion, it needs to go into brackets. So this is an exception to some of the rules that we've seen so far. You can't just put the number after, you need to put it in brackets. So for example, if our polyatomic anion, let's say our compound was Na3PO4. There's PO4 is our polyatomic piece. Since there's one of them, we can leave it as it is. Let's say we had Ca3 and PO4, there's going to be two of them. We need to write the PO4 in parentheses. So we do that so that we know there's two of them. This cannot be write, written as Ca3PO42 because that makes it looks, look like there's 42 oxygens. We also can't write it as Ca3P2O8 because that's actually a different compound. So both of these are incorrect. You write it in brackets, and you put the subscript outside of the brackets. So let's take a look at an example. Again, on the left, I've got some examples of polyatomic anions. Uh, actually, polyatomic ions. Ammonium is a cation. So we have lithium nitrate. Lithium is our metal, and we write it as Li. We know it has a 1 plus charge based on its position in the periodic table. We have nitrate. If we look in our um, polyatomic ions list, we know that is NO3. And then also from our polyatomics list, it tells us that it has a one negative charge. So now we can use either the zero sum or the crossing over rule. If we start off with the zero sum, 
we have a positive one charge for lithium, we add that to the negative one charge for nitrate, and that equals zero. So we don't need to do any more work. We know that we need one lithium ion and one nitrate ion. So that would give us the formula LiNO3. Now if we use the crossing over method, we'll write our symbols beside each other, and we'll use the charge on the lithium as the subscript for the nitrate. Now we don't use subscript 1, so we'll leave it blank. The charge on the nitrate is used as a subscript for the lithium. Again, a charge of 1, we don't add subscript 1, so we leave it as it is. So we end up with LiNO3. Let's take a look at another example. Aluminum carbonate. So aluminum is our metal. Al and it has a charge of 3 plus based on its position in the periodic table. Carbonate is our polyatomic anion and we can see that from the list it has the symbol CO3. Now we can also see from the polyatomics list that it has a charge of negative 2. So we have two options here, the zero sum or the crossing over. If we use the zero sum rule, we have aluminum uh, which has a 3 plus charge and we can add that to the carbonate which has a negative 2 charge which gives us a charge of 1. That does not equal 0 so we need to do a little bit of manipulation to get the overall charge to 0. If we have two of the aluminums and we have three of the carbonates that will give us an overall charge of 0. So we need three aluminum ions and uh, sorry we need two aluminum ions and we need three carbonate ions. So that gives us the formula Al2, and then in brackets, CO3, and then we write the three outside of brackets to indicate we need three of them. Let's try the crossing over method. So here we'll write our AlCO3 beside each other. We'll take the three and use it as the subscript for the CO3. So we need to put that CO3 in brackets and then we take the 2 from the CO3 and use it as the subscript for the aluminum like that. So we would end up with Al2 bracket CO3 bracket 3. So again we would end up with the same formula using either method. And we'll look at one final example here, ammonium fluoride. Ammonium actually is a polyatomic cation. They don't happen very often but they do sometimes and it has the formula NH4 with a 1 plus charge. Fluorine has the symbol F with a 1 negative charge based on its position in the periodic table. So we have our two methods here. Ammonium has a 1 plus charge and if we add that to the 1 negative of fluorine we end up with 0. So we know that we need 1 ammonium and we need 1 fluorine to get our overall charge. So that means our formula is NH4F. If we use our crossing over method, we'll write our symbols beside each other. We'll use the uh, charge from ammonium as the subscript for fluorine. We don't write subscript 1, so we leave it blank. We use the charge of fluorine and use it as the subscript for ammonium. Again, we don't write subscript 1, so we leave it blank. So we end up with NH4F. So let's take another look at our learning goals. You should be able to identify polyatomic compounds from their names and formulas. You should be able to de determine the name of a polyatomic compound from its formula and determine the formula of a polyatomic compound from its name. If you can do these things, fantastic. If not, please re-watch the video. And if you're still having trouble, come ask me in class tomorrow. All right, that's all for now. Bye-bye.